All right. Thanks everybody for joining. Um, for my for my partners in planning and urban design, do you think we have a, a good critical mass of participation to get started? Yeah. Okay. Well, hi, good afternoon, everybody. Now that it's 1201. Um, my name is Sarah May. I'm the chief planner of uh, the code amendments team at the planning and urban design department. Um, later on, we're hoping that uh, Dr. Udrea, our assistant director, is able to join us, but she's also in another meeting um, at the council briefing. So we're not sure if she's going to be able to make it or not, but um, I'm going to do my best when we get to the end uh, with questions. Um, and and I think um, Megan Weimer will also be able to help me out. Um, so just a, a few bits of business, um, just to let everybody know that everybody's muted, I think, except for me, uh, and that's so that I can start uh, going through the presentation um, without being interrupted, because um, at full speed, this presentation is going to last about 20 minutes. So um, the idea is to present for 20 minutes and then have about 20 minutes um, just for people to um, speak comments, you know, say what's on their mind, you know, I love it, I hate it, you know, I don't think you thought about whatever, or I appreciate whatever, um, but maybe res please reserve your questions for the very end. Um, if you wouldn't mind, um, you can type those in the chat and my partners will um, kind of collect those and try to synthesize, you know, what those questions are, and um, and then once everybody has had a chance to say something, if they want to say anything at all, um, then we'll roll over to our Q and A part at the very end. So, um, so I'm meant to be on this um, this slide here, but anyway, so we're gonna the presentation is gonna start with the authorization, go over the background, and the bulk of the slides are gonna be on uh, current regulations and conditions. <clears throat> and then the, the presentation will wind up with the CPC and staff recommendations, and that's when we'll get to our public comments section. Um, when we get to our public comments, if you just raise your hand, and then they'll move you to a, uh, uh, well, whatever, maybe unmute you at that time. I don't, I'm not really sure all the logistics. My team's going to help me out. Um, but that's when you'll be able to just say what's on your mind uh, in a couple of minutes or so. And then, um, meanwhile, during this whole thing, feel free to write a, a question in the chat, and that way our moderators can um, kind of help me and Megan get to those um, in a timely, orderly fashion, because my brain is full-on presentation mode right now. Um, one more thing, this QR code that we've had in the corner is our comment form. So if you just want to leave a comment in the comment form, we'd love to gather as much as many comments as we can, um, you know, it could be you love it, hate it, you, you know, or whatever, whatever you feel like commenting, we'd love to collect those. So, um, and also thank you for joining us. I know this lunch hour is, is hectic and I really appreciate you joining us and being with us today. All right. So really briefly, this is the authorization for the code amendment. I'm not going to read it all because it's a lot of of it would take a while to get through. But essentially, um, it's regarding three uses, child care facility, adult daycare facility, and day home, which is a specific accessory use for a single family or other residential use. Um, and everything that we are able to amend is contained within here. So we don't really have the ability to go outside of these guardrails. Okay, so a little background on this amendment, um, what it can and can't do, its scope and the timeline. Um, uh, so zoning is the uh, process that the Dallas Development Code enables. And um, within our Dallas Development Code, um, they have zoning districts. And within those districts, they establish what land uses are allowed. And the zoning districts also defines where the structures can be built. Um, and remember, it's where, um, not necessarily how, so it doesn't um, have any life safety issues. It, that's all a different um, thing. And then the development code can also make other reasonable, proportional, and related requirements so that um, each land use to, would be more compatible with surrounding land uses. 
Um, the development code cannot regulate operators of the same land use differently. It's got to treat all the land uses the same. And, um, and yes. So, um, uh, but other fun functions of government can regulate operators differently. And that would be um, a license maybe um, uh, by our, the state of Texas. Um, for example, for these three land uses that we're talking about, the Texas Health and Human Services um, issues licenses and performs regular inspections, and it's per operator and not by a land use. And uh, they also have to get a CO from Development Services, and they'll be reviewing and inspecting permits for compliance with the zoning, life, and safety um, regulations, like um, do they have a fire-rated corridor or their proper egress are there little babe, those little tiny sinks so that it's sanitary um does it have enough bathrooms all that all that sort of stuff is uh verified with the certificate of occupancy also code compliance will respond to complaints um and code violations and of course police and fire respond to emergencies so those are the things zoning doesn't really dictate Okay, so just to uh, be a broken record, the scope of our amendments are these uh, daycare facilities, children, adults, and uh, a small day home, which can occur within someone's residence. Um, it, we're not talking about public or private schools, uh, nursing homes, um, group dwelling units or boarding houses, assisted living, uh, retirement housing, community service centers. None of those are included within our scope um, in our authorization. So that's not part of our discussion. Certainly those, those factors come in in your daily life in the city, I'm sure. Okay, so for the, for the timeline of this amendment, it all started December 15th, 2022, when City Plan Commission um, issued a three member memo and requested that staff take a look at these uses and see what the appropriate zoning districts and other applicable regulations um, that, that are appropriate. Um, the, so staff looked at it and the Zoning Ordinance Advisory Committee met three times. Um, it was about nine hours of meeting um, and it's up on our website. Um, also City Plan Commission uh, met twice and that was about five or six hours. Uh, next, the Quality of Life uh, and Arts and Culture Council Committee met and was briefed on December 5th. And then um, it was put on the December 13th council agenda to be considered to be adopted. Um, but instead of adopting it, council held it under advisement until February 14th, um, which is coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, they wanted some more public engagement. Um, hence, we are doing the session and yesterday's session, and we've been reaching out to stakeholders and um, essentially uh, child care providers and adult daycare providers um, to get more information and more data, uh, which was also requested. Okay, so why I'm switching gears and we're kind of talk about this uh, accessory use called day homes next, their current regulations and conditions. Um, so a day home is incidental to the primary use as a residence. So that's a lot of words to say this will only happen in someone's home. And it's basically a small childcare facility that the owner that lives there, or not necessarily property owner, but the resident operates. Um, and it's currently by, allowed by right in all districts, which also includes all of our residential districts. Um, the city code limits attendees to 10. However, the state allows up to 12. And also no parking is required for day homes because um, most of the traffic generated is um, dropped off in the morning, basically, and picked up later on that night. Um, most of the caregivers that are bringing the children here aren't um, staying longer than, um, are not staying a long time. Um, and um, we had looked at some information on where day homes are currently located in Dallas. Um, as licensed by the state. <clears throat> and they have three different categories. Um, the first category limits kids to three. Um, so since our definition of a day home says it has to have at least four children, um, it is not technically considered 
as a day home in Dallas, but just that's why there's 18 of these in Dallas. Um, and they have to have a license. Um, and then the next two kinds are called a registered and a licensed child care home um, by the state. And uh, the registered variety um, limits children, limits it to six children. But in, in addition, they, um, let me close this window. Um, they can have six school aged children after school. Um, and the, so there's only 46 of those in Dallas and for the licensed who can have up to 12 per the state um, can care for children up to 24 hours, but obviously not overnight. Well, you know, more than a 24 hour period. Um, and there's 48 of those in the city. Okay. All right, so we're switching gears again to talk about child care facilities. Um, so these are your kind of more traditional child care facilities. Um, they uh, provide care, training, education, custody, and treatment or supervision for persons under 14 years of age. Um, and another big uh, difference between this use and the previous use is that it cannot the the use cannot be used as a residence. Um, so. Uh, these are like your daycare centers where nobody's living there. Um, they are currently allowed by right in retail, commercial service, industrial, all of our downtown uh, mixed use and some others. And that is represented in the green on the map to the right. Um, in the yellow are all of our residential districts where the, this use and spoiler alert, the adult daycare facilities um, require a specific use permit but are allowed by SUP. And um, if you are able to pinpoint any red tiny dots, those are our MF3 and 4 uh, districts. So that's um, our higher density, taller buildings, multifamily um, districts and our office districts. And the reason why it's red is because these uses are limited um, are, are only allowed to be a limited use, which means it can only occupy 10% of the building. Um, otherwise, it doesn't say an SUP is required or anything, so it's basically prohibited. Um, and all the dark gray areas kind of in the in the middle, those are our plan development districts. So when we looked at where the state has licenses for uh, what they call a child care program center, which is probably closest to um, our child care facilities, we found that there are 281 in the city. And however, it is important to know that some of these kind of use like a loophole, if you will, in our development code and are not considered a child care facility, um, either because they are located within a public or private school. Uh, many of you know DISC um, offers some pre-K programs. Um, so obviously they would have a license, but since it's in a school, the land use is not considered a, a child care facility, it's considered a public or private school. Um, also, um, whenever it's located in a church, operated by the church, and uh, the employees of the uh, child care are employees of the church, it's not technically considered a child care facility per our um, development code. So um, just to give you a, a note of where they are and about, about how many we have in Dallas. Um, when we take these locations and we look at the zoning, it's fairly evenly distributed between single family and multifamily uh, plan development districts and some and our retail areas. Um, or or non-residential, I would say. Um, uh, sorry that the colors are a little different on this map, but uh, the same kind of uh, uh, methodology applies. The brown is kind of the, the new, um, the new information on this map that just shows you where our multifamily zoning districts are. Um, and uh, as you can tell, there's really not that much multifamily zoning in the city. It is primarily single family duplex townhome, but uh, honestly, primarily single family, largely single family. Um, the gray also is PDs and uh, all the pins that you see here are where we have specific use permits. Um, for a child care facility are the red ones um, where it's only for a child care facility. The blue ones are for child care facility that's with a school. So 
Yeah, technically those are uh, just a school land use and not necessarily considered child care um, facilities on their own. Um, and when we looked at um, uh, where we have SUPs and what zoning district they are, remember since they only require an SUP in residential district, um, I did an analysis of our base zoning residential districts um, and uh, single family had the most at 80 um, child care program centers from the state and out of those 80, only 20% had a specific use permit for a child care facility. Um, and overall in all residential, it came out to 26%. Um, so I, I know that we think that it's, um, that having a, an SUP is incredibly important, but we only have 26% of our facilities have an SUP. Um, overall citywide, um, there's only 37. That includes the SUPs with schools out of 281 facilities. So only about 13% of child care facilities currently have SUPs. So they're finding some way to get around it, probably with a church or inside of sometimes without a, within a school. Okay. So there's a lot of literature out there that says that there's a, uh, a, a big need for child care. It's not just Dallas, it's the state of Texas and it's the country. Um, but in Texas specifically, according to the census and um, Texas Health and Human Services, there's only capacity for 37% of children under five in Dallas. And that includes all the in-home child care facilities that are allowed by right currently. Um, the image on the right of Dallas is from childcaredeserts.org. And if you have a chance to go take a look at their website, it's really interactive and interesting. Um, but the dark orange um, areas in Dallas are areas where they found um, child care opportunities to be scarce. Um, and I think that was the methodology was a uh, number of children under five and how many slots are available. And I think whenever um, it was under 30% of capacity, or maybe under 50, I'm not sure, it, it got rated as, to, as a scarcity. So, um, okay, so switching to adult daycare now, trying to go fast. Um, the, um, the definition in our development code is very similar to childcare facility. Um, the one big difference is that as for persons 18 years of age or older, um, instead of the 14 and under uh, for the child care. So sneak peek that there's an age gap in here. Um, uh, the same districts are the, are, are the same. So we still have our by right, uh, by SUP and limited uh, map here. It applies for both uses. Um, right now we only have 10 adult daycare facilities in all of Dallas and they're um, kind of noted right here. Um, there's also a expected large demand for adult take care and, um, it's lots of different reasons, but the primary reason seems to be, um, that we're, people are living longer and, um, we have a lot more people that are living longer than we did in 1960. Um, as you can see on the graphic here from the census bureau. Um, and also people's risk for developing dementia or other cognitive, cognitive impairments, um, increase as they age. So in order to provide, um, additional services and allowing people to age in place, um, adult daycare facilities could be a really helpful tool in that, um, effort. And, um, okay. Uh, also the census says that by the year 2035. Um, adults age 65 and older are going to outnumber children under 18. Moving on to existing regulations um, that um, make daycares more compatible in residential. We have um, existing zoning regulations in residential zoning um, that allows um, these three uses um, to be, um, it, it says the off street parking, whether that's required parking or extra parking, it cannot be located in the front yard setback. 
in residential districts. Also, parking cannot be disconnected from the main use, so it can't be across the street or leapfrog a house. It's got to be on the same lot as a main use when we're in residential zoning. Um, structures cannot be in any setback, which is true in all districts, but in residential districts, just to make it clear that in residential zoning, um, the front yard setback for a residential structure also applies to non-residential structures, and it has to be consistent across the block. Um, also for their signs, um, they can only be a monument or a small attached sign, meaning it's on the building. Um, there cannot be any pole signs, and I don't think it can even be illuminated um, in residential districts. So if you think about um, maybe if there's a church in your neighborhood, think about how big their sign could be, and that might be a good um, comparison for you to think about. Um, also, they have to have parking screening. So they have to have a six foot solid fence to screen parking from adjacent residential uses um, or vacant lots. Um, they also have to screen their dumpsters and there's some other regulations, but those are the big ones. Um, there's also other non-residential regulations that apply just to the child care facilities and adult daycare facilities. Um, it does not apply to day homes because these are basically considered single family uses and they do not require a certificate of occupancy. Although if they're a day home, remember they require a license from the state. So for our facilities that require a CO, they have to meet all the international building codes such as handicap accessibility requirements, emergency exits, fire rated building materials, fire sprinklers or alarms, which could be $100,000 or more. Um, they have occupancy limits. They um, have to have tiny hand washing sinks. Um, all, all those um, sanitary facilities are also required. Um, and for new construction and additions that are 35% or more, or if they were to add 2,000 square feet of new paving, um, they would have to comply with our uh, landscaping requirements of the city, which requires landscape buffers to residential um, neighbors, um, street trees, site trees, foundation planning, and I think they also have a design requirement just in the uh, um, in the pavement. Um, they also, of course, have to have licensed and registered contractors to go through all this commercial construction um, and the building um, inspections would, would be performed throughout um, and the fire marshal uh, would inspect every year. Um, in addition, the state license, the state licensing requirements also requires an annual inspection and they often have unannounced inspections which um, have to happen at least once a year. Okay, so finally, we got to the CPC and staff recommended changes. And all, all these are based on all these other factors that I already described. You know, um, these facilities are considered uh, to be for our residents, necessary in community life. Um, we need a lot more of them, and it's hard to just open one up without any you know thought because it's very expensive they have a lot of requirements they have to meet and um so we're moving to our city and staff sorry cpc and staff recommendations so just to highlight those um i'm starting with accessory day homes uh which is where we started our presentation um so the recommendation is to remove the age limitation so that if they wanted to take care of some seniors in their home, they could obviously if they need a license from the state um, and um, for the child care. Well, and to also align the maximum attendee uh, limit to match the states and so to increase it from 10 to 12 attendees. I put the comment form in there again, just in case you feel like scanning that. Um, I think it's also in the chat. Um, also, we have. Uh, some recommendations specifically for child care facilities and adult daycare facilities. Um, I often just say daycares to just run them together to save some breath, but um, the recommendation is to combine those two into one land use. Obviously, they'll have separate uh, state licenses and all the standards on staffing ratios and minimum 
um, square footage per attendee and, and child or adult still still applies. It doesn't matter that we combine them into one land use. Um, also, it would be um, to allow these uses by right in all zoning districts, um, including residential, except that in commercial service and industrial, CPC and staff had recommended originally to uh, council to add a specific use permit um, to those districts um, in an effort to try to keep these very vulnerable populations somewhat separated from industrial um, uses. So just to um, give you a, a, a sneak peek, we have a some inkling that council might just um, um, forego that SUP requirement in commercial service and industrial zoning districts. We're not really sure how it's gonna shake out for the residential side, but they have indicated that they may not be willing to add a specific use permit in those districts. Um, we also have recommended to, uh, or both CPC and staff to eliminate the minimum off street parking requirements. Again, these uses don't have a lot of um, traffic throughout the day, um, or even a burst of traffic, like um, a public school might be where there's a start time and a dismissal time. Um, parents and caregivers are normally arriving throughout the morning and picking up throughout the evening. So there's um, a lot of studies that um, say that the square footage don't doesn't really um, specifically relate to the amount of parking demanded of these uses. And um, remember, even if it's not required, they cannot construct parking spaces in the front yard setback in residential districts. Um, they also um, the recommendation is to add some additional provisions, just extra provisions. On top of all the other things we already talked about, um, so that it's even more sensitive in residential districts. So they cannot have overnight outdoor activity. Um, they cannot have um, a lot coverage or height that's any uh, any higher or bigger than residential structures. So the structures themselves will be in scale with the um, residential structures if they ever actually develop in a residential neighborhood. Okay, so with that, I am at the end of my presentation. Um, I am going to take a minute to catch my breath and um, we're gonna move into a the next 20 minutes or so of uh, public comments. So if you, and again, this is really more for like statements. Um, if you have a lot of questions, um, please give us a heads up by putting it in the chat. And then we'll, um, once we're done with comments of people just wanting to speak their mind, um, then we'll move to our kind of Q&A session. And, and that'll give us enough time to look at the questions and um, we'll have one of the moderators read it out. And, uh, and then me and Megan um, will start to answer those questions verbally um, if it wasn't sufficient in the presentation. And, um, and then, yes, um, and then we can also, once we get through the written questions, then maybe we can just start going through people with hands raised um, on if they want to verbalize their question. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and stop this. And let's see, so so just a reminder, we're, we're starting with people that just wanna say something. And so thank you. And so we have a hand raised right now. And uh, Mr. Morrow, would you like to start us off with some comments? Let me, let me, I, let's see, request sent. You might have to, there we go. We can okay. hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Right. Uh, I apologize. I was not able to sign on right on time, but I did submit uh, two questions uh, to help me understand uh, the information you presented to city council back on December the 13th. And one of those, the first question was, um, there, is there a difference between day home and child care facility? Um, and I guess the second question, um, to, oh yes, the second question was in um, page, on page 11 of that presentation that was submitted to the city of Dallas, uh, city council, 
uh, under district permits and residential districts. I'd had a paragraph with regards to explaining why you were asking for what you're asking. And amongst, amongst that information or part of that paragraph, it says um, that the staff and CPC recommend uh, amendments to allow these uses, that is daycare and adult care, operate by right without SUP in all residential districts and remove one of the many regulatory barriers that would, you know, encourage accessibility to care services. What are those many regulatory barriers, barriers besides the uh, uh, health and human services requirements? Sure. Um, so uh, back to your first question, the differences between the child care facility and the day home mm -hmm. is that the day home is considered an accessory use to the primary use, which is probably most often a single family home. Um, it technically can also occur within an apartment if uh, if they can meet all the state licensing requirements. And um, so those uses, they don't have it have to get a certificate of occupancy. They don't have to bring their building up to, um, you know, educational occupancy requirements with fire rated walls and an egress pathway to the door. You know, all of those extra barriers um, in construction costs and staffing right. and all those things. And well, so the child care facility would. Is there, a, is there a limit on the number of children? It, for child care facilities or for day or home? Day, care, day home. Yes, um, currently the city limits those attendees to 10 children, but the state allows 12. So part of the recommendation is to align the maximum on day homes to line up with the state regulations of 12. Okay, so if if you have 12 or fewer, you can have the home care and you right. don't need to have uh, SUP and uh, you're allowed by right. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not considered child care. Right. So I'm guessing child care facilities would be any facility that is over 12 children. I think technically it's seven. And, and the other big thing is that a day home has to be in someone's home. So uh, you could theoretically have a child care facility for seven children, but it's just, I, I'm sure it just isn't done much just for the extra expenses. Uh, I think the, the data is that most child care facilities aren't even interested in opening unless they can have 80. And so to have 80, that's about 6,000 square feet of a building. Um, just when you add in all the egress requirements in a corridor, the closet space, the bathrooms, you know. Yeah, all yeah, the yeah. yeah. Stuff. Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna move on fast. There's a lot of people here. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it sounds like that you can have a child care facility greater than seven people, greater than 12 people in a residential neighborhood, but uh, you have to go through the SUP process, correct? That's right. Yeah. And you're and looking that process, to, sorry. And you're looking to remove you, in the proposal, you're looking to remove that. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of been a little routine in all the SUPs that we've been receiving over the past, you know, since 1960 or whatever. Um, most operators have already come up with a design. Um, they they know their requirements of the state. Um, and then uh, it's it's really kind of a hurdle because, you know, they're not used to construction and uh, politics and the, the political wrangling kind of that uh, SUPs bring about. Um, so they normally have to hire a consultant. They have to work really hard with staff just to meet the minimum requirements of submitting the application. And um, it really does put someone who primarily just wants to teach young children or maybe hopefully um, seniors in, in the in the future. Um, it, it puts a lot and they have to wait until the entire SUP process is complete, which takes longer. Um, if it gets held or they, you know, if it has a lot of questions that come up, um, but there would be no have to complete the SUP there, to no, start their permit. There would be no requirements other than the health and human services otherwise. They can and do building they codes to. and building and codes. Can't, okay. yeah. All right. I, I've asked um, more than fair, my fair share. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, John, for your question. And if we if we could just reiterate that this is a time for um, comments. So if you have 
if there's anyone just strictly with comments, if you can um, raise your hand and we can take those comments and then after that we can um, take any questions. And I see that Melanie Rubin has a comment. I'll um, take you off of mute. Thank you all. And thank you to stop for this that great presentation. I'm Melanie Rubin. I'm the director of the North Texas Early Education Alliance, which is a coalition of Dallas residents committed to increasing access to quality early education and child care. As we've all heard today, as we've read in the paper, and as we know, Dallas does indeed have an insufficient supply of child care with too many child care deserts and inaccessibility for children. This limits children's developmental experiences as well as their parents' work productivity, resulting in social and economic costs to children, parents, their employers, and ultimately all taxpayers. The good news is we know what kids and communities need to thrive. The bad news is we're not making these environments readily accessible. The pandemic made a disjointed childcare system deteriorate even further. Dallas parents struggle to find accessible, affordable quality childcare, and employers feel the brunt of this loss. On behalf of the North Texas Early Education Alliance and the Dallas County Commission on Child Care, I applaud the recommendations before you today. Removing the SUP requirement is smart, strategic policy, which will remove barriers and expenses for childcare providers and facilitate access. Increasing access to childcare close to where families live will significantly enhance neighborhoods provide quality environments for children, and help parents get to work. I hope that we don't get caught up in an unsubstantiated narrative. This code amendment will not result in childcare centers popping up all over the city. Sadly and truthfully, unfortunately, childcare is not a lucrative business. Most providers subsidize the costs by accepting inadequate salaries that ba and barely can make ends meet. They do this work out of a commitment to children and families. No large capacity programs are enabled by this code change because it retains all the current restrictions, including minimum front, side, and rear yard setbacks, the prohibition of off-street parking and front yard setback, compliance with all state and federal licensing, annual inspections, and compliance with the International Business Code and American with Disabilities Act requirements. These restrictions ensure that this change will not result in large centers opening in neighborhoods. Historically, childcare has not caused any issues in areas where the, where the SUPs were already granted. We have a, a blueprint to work from. And during the past fiscal year, all SUP applications for childcare facilities were approved with minimal or no opposition from nearby residents and property owners. Childcare is not a disruptive oversized industry. It is a service that truly serves the community. We appreciate the thoughtful and thorough analysis of the planning commission, of city staff, and the city committees with this recommendation, which is a step in the right direction to better meet the needs of Dallas residents and employers by facilitating in increased access to childcare. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands raised. So Megan or Jennifer, would, would you mind um, helping me out to see if there's any questions in the chat that. Yes, um, I, I have, let's see, going back. The first que uh, question is from Krista Cantrell. Is there going to be a study done of the specific street for each application? Even though people are only dropping off and picking up, this could cause traffic concerns on some streets especially in residential areas? Um, so that's not something that the Planning and Urban Design Department can do. The Transportation Office, if you do witness some uh, traffic issues on your street, they, um, they generally work off of a complaint-based system. So if there's a lot of complaints in your street about um, people parking illegally or um, streaks being blocked, that's a, it's a great um, way to get those issues at least looked at by transportation professionals. If you can enter in a, um, a request on 311 and give them as many specifics as you can and continue to do that as often if it, as it happens. Okay, um, next question. 
uh, from my Chandra Davis. Um, she is in home child care and uh, wants to know about having a child care sign in the yard. I think there's a current provision for the accessory day homes that say they may not have signs um, outside. I, th I think that's what the regulations say. Yes, Sarah, I do have it right here in front of me. Um, so, yes, a person who conducts a day home use shall not use an advertisement sign or display on or off the premises. And so, if that's something I think that you would like to change, I think that's something at this point that you need to request of council. Because if they are going to remove that, um, they'll need to ask for a motion um, to remove that requirement. Which might be an uphill battle at this point. <laughs> and if I could just maybe offer something on this as well, um, that kind of addresses 1 of the other comments in the chat um, there. When talking about day homes, uh, there was a comment about how, you know, currently they're limited to 10 or fewer kids. You know, we're hoping to through this amendment to change that to 12 to align with the state. But then the comment said that SUPs are for larger facilities. And that's true to some extent, but also if there is a small daycare that just can't meet the requirements um, or the, you know, conditions that are for the day homes, the SUP now would be, you know, a process to have a daycare that has advertising on site or off premise or has, you know, something that that can't be accomplished under the current conditions. So I guess just to it, it doesn't a, a child care facility that doesn't qualify as a day home is not necessarily a large, you know, completely out of scale business. It's just, I, I'm rambling, but I just kind of wanted to put that out there. Right, and to reiterate, like the um, part of the benefits of this code amendment is to further, well, it's to restrict these uh, childcare facilities in residential districts to not exceed the height um, of a residential structure. Right now, they're allowed any legal height. Um, um, also, it's to further restrict the um, lot coverage um, for these child care facilities. Um, right now, they're allowed 60% lot coverage. And in a lot of our single family zoning districts, um, residential structures are limited to 40 or 45%. So this would bring that restriction, it would make it more restrictive on these child care facilities or adult daycare facilities to bring that lot coverage to be that of a residential structure in those districts. So it's it's to also make them compatible in scale in residential neighborhoods. Okay, um, there was a, a question from Karen Robert, Roberts about the options and process for an SUP um, to be granted automatic renewal. I went ahead and answered that in the chat. Um, and also put um, some information about the costs associated with SUPs and then for the automatic renewal. Um, but uh, Ms. Roberts had another question. Um, please, please make it clear that the SUP is not required in a residential home when the owner cares for 10 or fewer children. SUP is for larger facilities. Okay, I think you just addressed that, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, can Ms. Rubin or other nonprofit related providers please tell us what they estimate to be the increase in child care with the elimination of the SUP requirement? Let me, let me, we're going to try to un, unmute. Is that working? Unmute. There you go. So, unfortunately, we sorry. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Unfortunately, we don't have really hard and fast data on this. We don't expect it's going to, um, you know, again, solve the childcare issue and it's going to take care of childcare showing up in every neighborhood. Um, 
based on anecdotally, we have heard from several providers who have said they would be happy to do the service, but they it's too cumbersome and they, they, you know, they're doing all they can to stay in business where they are or to, to keep operating that it's just really a cumbersome process that takes a lot of time and, and additional resources and they don't have the bandwidth to do it. So we don't think it's going to be an exponential increase, but we do think a few neighborhoods will benefit from some additional programs opening. Again, unfortunately, we're, we're, we've spoken to providers who started the process and then kind of gave up or that they it just seemed too daunting and they didn't want to do it. We don't think it's going to be a game changer, unfortunately, but I do think it's a step to start opening the door and start helping some neighborhoods with some smaller programs. Mr. Ribbon, do you know anything? Do you have any like numbers associated with maybe um, how much a, a like your typical child care providers out of the tuition they receive from caregivers? How much of that goes back into staff salaries? So I, I can pull up some data, but you actually have a provider who I think wanted to actually testify as well to buy the homes on on the call. If we can unmute her, she's way more the expert than I am, and, and I would defer to her on that. What what was that name again? Tabitha Holmes. Oh, okay. Jolanda, are you able to find her? Yes, I can unmute her now. And if not, I can certainly follow back up with you. I mean, okay. hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. I am Tabitha Holmes. I'm the um, actually I'm the president for Early Education Leaders Coalition. We are about 87 owners of child care, um, 87 members strong for home-based and center-based providers in the DFW area. I'm also a child care provider uh, as well for this is my 27th year being a business owner uh, of having a quality child care center. And so the number that you're looking at technically when you're speaking of how much our income needs to um, is for payroll, it's usually supposed to stay around 40%. However, with the broken system that we have currently, and the pandemic has exposed a lot of um, the needs in the childcare industry, sometimes the, the percentage for um, payroll is usually close to 60%. And that's because some providers are trying to be able to uh, allow staff to have wages, livable wages, um, so they will be able to meet their bills and also to, to keep them employed at the facilities. So we're, we're struggling, but technically we wanna keep that number at about 40% or below. However, I just wanna also reiterate that this will allow a few providers to, well, not a few, but providers to open because we have thousands of children who actually need care. I do believe it is our responsibility to make sure that our uh, children have a foundation and that we uh, allow them to attend a quality, um, we say preschool, um, that affirms and expands them. We want to make sure that our children get the foundation uh, for what they need, because this stage is where they're developing and growing tremendously. So we know that there are certain responsibilities that we have. We also know that when we have laid a good foundation that in preschool, that these children excel and they um, do better in school, the attendance is better, their grades are better parents are able to work and not have to take off of school. I mean, take off of work because of um, negative impacts that are happening when children do not have that good foundation. We know that when they have the good foundation, these children um, graduate. A lot of the children go on to college and become productive citizens, which it is our responsibility to make sure that we reach back and teach our children so they can become responsible. Um, I know you've kind of noticed that we have a lot of issues since the pandemic as well uh, with mental health. And so now in the child care industry, we, um, there are some other additional needs that we, we um, need to have as far as uh, with the mental, mental health 
my apology, mental health for the children. So this would be a, a great advantage uh, for allowing people to open up to provide quality care um, that our children need in order to uh, be productive citizens. So appreciate your time. Thanks. Thank you for those comments and that insight. Appreciate it. Oh, Jennifer, if you're speaking, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, from uh, Christine Hopkins, was any research done on how many folks operate unlicensed uh, child care uses in their home? And has any consideration gone into whether in exchange for lifting the SUP requirements, there could be some other rule put in place that would encourage registration and or licensure, i.e. to make sure monitoring is actually happening? Um, so, unfortunately, there's no way to gather data on out of compliance. Um, people who are not operating in compliance with their code that that I know of. I, did, Megan, are you raising your hand? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, generally studies show that when um, barriers re regulatory barriers are removed and there is a path to comply. Um, People normally come into compliance a lot easier. I think a, a lot of the times people um, operate outside of the boundaries of compliance, maybe because it's too difficult or they think it's too um, too onerous or impossible. And so I think making it more possible is a way to get more uh, compliant childcare facilities. Um, uh, Shalanda, can you unmute? Ms. Hopkins, I think she's raising her hand for a, a follow up to that. Yes, um, she should be able to speak now. Looks like she's still muted, I think. There we Can go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, so. Um, it seems like this SUP requirement is going to save the city money because the city is no longer going to be have to having to process all of these child care SUPs. And I'm just wondering, like, has the city ever done like an educational campaign, bilingual educational campaign about like, here's how you get like licensed and registered with the state, the state, here's like how you make sure you're in compliance because I mean, it's it, 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 when you were showing your numbers about the number of these facilities that are supposed to have SUPs now and don't, it seems like there's a great deal of non-compliance in that area. I can only imagine the non-compliance in, you know, registration, uh, either being a listed family home or a licensed or registered home, or, you know, having HHS monitoring of any kind is, is pretty significant as well. And okay. just, I guess, yes. Thinking that, you know, it has some thought gone into whether if this SUP requirement is going to be lifted, could there, this, this come along with some kind of educational campaign or I don't know what the limits are in zoning. It's one slide said you can't discriminate based on types of of. Uh, uses or like differences in uses, but maybe does that mean you can't say like, well, this is allowed without an SUP if you're licensed or registered with the state, but not if you're not? <laughs> Like, I, I don't know. Oh, yeah, you're, you're, you're correct. It's, it can be very confusing and, and difficult to understand. Um, and, and about, about the, um, the SGP in that slide that showed, um, maybe like an average of 25% of childcare facilities have an SGP. I would just uh, want to further clarify that that doesn't mean the other 75% are non compliant. It just means that the Dallas development code doesn't call those operators child care facilities. And the only difference would be that maybe they are owned and operated by a religious institution um, or they're owned and operated by a, um, a private school or a public school. Um, so it's not that because to get a, a license from the state, you have to let regularly show you have a certificate of occupancy to operate to care for children. And so the, it was just to demonstrate that we're caring for our children currently in the city. There are some loopholes with being either a school or a church, 
um, that can get you out of the SUP requirement. So it was really to demonstrate that the SUP doesn't just flat out deny anybody from uh, operating a child care facility is that there, there are ways to come into compliance with that. And um, about the saving us money, unfortunately, um, we're an enterprise fund, meaning that um, our staff is paid for the postage we send out in the mail, our um, newspaper ads that we have to put in required by law are all funded by application fees. So it doesn't really save us any money. It really just saves a, a process that um, seems to be maybe over overkill for for these providers that are desperately needed. Okay. okay. Um, um, we also have uh, Mr. Morrow's hand up. But I guess we still have right. more questions. Yeah, we've got, I've got him in the queue. We've got a few more questions and then um, Mr. Morrow will be up pretty soon. Um, from Karen Roberts, uh, will eliminating the SUP in multifamily residential areas help increase the amount of childcare? Um, so based on that map, if y'all can remember where we had the brown um, centers and it also showed that we only had four childcare centers in multifamily zoning districts, um, it was our assessment that uh, just allowing it in multifamily is not a big enough um, door to actually remove many barriers. Sh certainly, we need childcare in multifamily zoning, but we also need childcare provided to um, lower density neighborhoods. Um, usually, uh, or there's people often prefer maybe moving out to a single family neighborhood when once they start having kids and it sure would be nice to allow um, more child care facilities in both lower density and multifamily zoning districts okay um there's a question from dustin that i uh answered briefly in the chat but i don't know if um either you or megan would like to expand the question is, is, is there a possibility that a building can have a co-license for both adult daycare and group home? Like I said, I answered it a bit in the chat, but if you want to expand on that at all, it'd be great. Uh, when we talked to operators um, of those two uses, uh, none of them were aware of that being a, a typical work product of uh, for them to combine children and seniors all in the same facility. Um, certainly, they would have to meet all the state licensing requirements and ratios and, um, you know, all, all the state licenses. And basically, if they did both, they would have licenses for both. But um, it doesn't seem to be a trend um, anywhere in the states. There have been, um, so I've seen some articles on some Scandinavian countries that do like to um, put the two together and have shown how it, um, you know, children need adults to spend time with them, read with them, you know, um, you know, mentor them and, um, uh, and, and adults enjoy spending time around children. So there might be an opportunity to, um, make a better community that way, but, um, it's not really a, a thing in the United States right now. So. Okay. Um, and then. Uh, we've got one more question and then Mr. Morrow with a hand raised. And I think that that's all I'm seeing at this point. So um, from Ms. Roberts, uh, what other efforts is the city of Dallas taking to increase the amount of child care? Um, I'm not an expert on that. We have a, an office of community care. I know they have WIC services uh, for children and women in need. Um, I think that there's um, the state changed some legislation to encourage um, funds being offered to child care facilities. Um, but there's a lot of government programs out there that issue grants. And I don't know if Ms. Rubin or any of our other child care operators can answer some of that. <laughs> so let's see. Let's. Um, gonna, also. Uh, yeah, I think Ms. Rubin wants to, if we can, um, there we go. Sure. So um, there's there's not as much uh, government money as you think, uh, certainly not enough to, to meet the need, truthfully. 
Um, the state does not really put in much money for childcare. The federal government puts in money for the subsidy program, but it certainly does not meet the need of Dallas for the local workforce board area right now, which is, you know, the Dallas County primarily. I think we, the last I saw, we had over 5,000 kids on a wait list to get that money. So we're really not touching the need from that side. There is an opportunity coming in front of the city that you're right, sir. There was some legislation um, that was um, passed by Senator West that will be in front of the council in February that could allow for a tax abatement for childcare providers from municipal taxes. So um, again, tiny, tiny little incremental steps. We are still not really addressing how to make this industry work to be able to meet the needs of children and families, but there's a little bit of effort. And the city does also have a very small program um, that it runs to, to help um, subsidize some of the costs and some support some of the providers, but definitely nothing touching on the need. Thank you. Sure. Um, also, before we get to Mr. Morrow, um, Dustin clarified in the chat that he was asking about group home for seniors. Um, and Nicole Gann clarified or actually made a comment that Juliet, Juliet Fowler communities serves both populations and and it's correct that there are not many. Yeah. Um, and then, so thank you for that clarification and the follow up. Um, and can someone unmute Mr. Morrow? There we go. There. I'm unmuted. Thank you. So, other than the $1,170 uh, initial application fee for a special uh, use permit uh, and filling out the two page form and addressing that que those questions. What are the other limitations to having as SUP? Yeah. Oh, Jennifer, she's in. Go for it, Jennifer. <laughs> I, I, I'm someone that I'm one of the, the folks that works in the current planning side that processes these zoning applications. And so if I could just address that quickly, just from my own personal experience in working with daycares, uh, child care facilities that come through for an SUP, and just generally for the SUP process, there's the initial application fee. Um, there is, as you mentioned, there's an application that needs to be filled out, but there are a number of um, additional pieces of information that have to be obtained and submitted with that. One of the biggest ones that ends up being a hurdle for many child care facilities is that we need a, a site plan um, to reflect um, what's actually occurring on site. And we we had a representative last night from um, Hart House that's in Vickery Meadow um, up in the north part of the city. Um, and she was actually, that was actually one of the cases I worked on. and. They came through and they had, I mean, it's, it's a, a big cost factor for them to hire someone to draft the site plan. They ended up having someone kind of do pro bono for them because the funds sometimes just were not there, nor was the knowledge The the director of the daycare was trying to, to kind of uh, go through the process with the city. And, you know, she, she takes care of kids. She, she doesn't do site plans and permits and all that kind of stuff. So it's really outside of her wheelhouse but she didn't have the funds to necessarily hire someone. So she was relying on the kindness of whoever to help her get through the process. And it was significantly delayed um, because of the extra documentation and, and cost associated with that. So, so that one was tough this, because- Wouldn't, wouldn't the site that? plan include a lot of information that you're gonna require for them to have um, in order to operate Legally, I mean, you know, uh, you know fire abatement, et cetera, et cetera. They're going to have to address that anyway, are they not? Well, but this was this, this, for example, and what happens a lot of times is these are at existing, these are locations that have existing buildings that she, they were operating in this case within um, multifamily complex. So there were there wasn't really any new building that needed to happen. There wasn't really permitting that needed to be gone through. Um, but the SUP process requires its own site plan, and it's it doesn't contain exactly the same information that you would need for permitting because we're really just talking about 
is the land use appropriate for this particular location? That's really the extent of what we do at the zoning change process. Mr. Morrow is muted again. Mr. Morrow is muted again. Can someone? Oh, I'm sorry. I just unmuted right when he got, oh, let me see. Okay, chill on it. I'd like, I'd like to point out that the issue, these are, these are noble causes, but they are businesses in neighborhoods. And for an owner of a home in a neighborhood, the only input we would have one way or the other, either for or against, or to help form the uh, introduction of a child care facility in the neighborhood is through the SUP process. Otherwise, we have no voice at all. And you're putting a commercial business in a residential district. So, um, like I say, it's a noble cause, but to remove the SUP process, I think is, uh, is, is not really, um, well, let's put it this way. It, it is such an onerous process that none were turned down last year. According to the information you provided city council back on December the 13th, all SUP submissions were accepted. There were probably some that were augmented and changed, but they were accepted. And if you're running a business, even though it's on shoestrings, uh, it can be 24 seven. And even though the proposal is that you can't have anybody out playing between the hours of 7, 7, I mean, 10 p.m. and 7 a.m., you can have children coming and going and screaming, because I live next to an elementary school and I know what that's like, uh, all the way up to 10 p.m., Monday through Sunday through Sunday. So, uh, like I say, I think this is a noble thing. I, I think adding the two together makes lots of sense for the city and for the administration thereof adding 10 to 12 people to home care uh i think that's what you call it or daycare uh without an sup seems to work fine but when you get up to a larger size facility uh, uh then you've got you've got issues that uh impact the neighborhood and uh i think it's appropriate for residents of neighborhoods to have some kind of input if they want to have input uh, with regards to a commercial facility, even though it's not making any money uh, to be in their neighborhood. Um, and it may not affect any or it may affect few, uh, and hardly be there. Um, but I am very much aware of a daycare facility, um, which was in the city of Dallas uh, and Highland Park University School District uh, run in a $2.25 million home. Uh, and these people, you know, charge anywhere of $1,600 a child per month. So it may be designed to address perhaps a lower social economic uh, area, so to speak, because uh, that's the kind of the banner I kind of hear. But that doesn't mean that that's necessarily what's going to happen. So, uh, like I say, uh, it's a noble action, uh, but I think we should keep the SUP process. And I and I know I'm I'm. Um, <laughs> this is not the forum to bring this up, but uh, it's uh, before city council members. But uh, anyway, I wanted to um, to make my my uh, my case since Ms. Rubin had made her case. Thank you. Thank you so much, and and we do appreciate you coming. You know. And hearing your thoughts. I mean, it, and it I is think a we listening have, session. That's that's what we're here for. Yeah. So, yes, yeah. absolutely. Thank you for coming. And I think we have two other hands raised. Is what I heard from the moderators. So, I'll let Jennifer take it away. Who, who's next? Um, the next I, person I we have of... is Thomas Buck. Um, yeah. And I'll take you off of mute. Hi, can, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can hear you. Hi, right, thank you, Sarah and staff for uh, making yourselves available today and uh, last night. I hope it went well last night. 
I'm glad to see a lot of people in attendance at this meeting, um, much more than Paul Ridley's meeting that was held last week. Um, I have a question concerning the commercial service and industrial zoning districts and why uh, there's uh, you want to continue using a special use permit. Is that to protect, obviously, families, children from going into these areas that pose a potential threat that could pose a potential threat? Yes, in a nutshell, that's correct. Uh, currently, they're allowed by right in commercial services and industrial zoning districts. But um, since those are the districts where a lot of um, freight trucks and industrial uses are supposed to occur, uh, we didn't think it was really the best plan or that, you know, um, caring for these vulnerable populations really make the best neighbors. Um, so that's why, um, you know, the original recommendation was just to prohibit it because if it really is a good candidate for some other zoning, because we have lots of zoning in Dallas that are zone, that's zoned industrial, but they're full of neighborhoods, um, then obviously they could change their zoning to a district that allow, that may be more appropriate. Um, but the idea was to um, protect the vulnerable populations and um, encourage them to not be surrounded by um, a lot of air pollution and other um, possible dangers. Sure. So but it, 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 it seems that council maybe is not willing to apply the SUP there. So they might, they most likely will continue to be allowed by right. Got it. So it, it, is it a housing? Could it be a housing initiative to incentivize businesses in industrial zones that do not pose a potential threat to um, to encourage care facilities to be placed next to them? I ask because my limited research, you know, work, workforce parents are the most affected by this, right? Especially mm -hmm. single workforce parents. And to have care facilities closer to where they work, I think would be essential to them. Mm -hmm. Um, and to, so that they can drop them off, they can be close to them and they can have lunch with them if they want. Um, I think it's, it's from what I've read, a lot of workforce families are not being able to work because there's not enough care facilities and they have to stick, they have to do it themselves. Right? Mm -hmm. So I, any way, any way to incentivize or encourage, uh, you know, these, uh, these care facilities to work in these zones in, in commercial service and industrial zones that do not pose a potential threat. And I know that's probably, you know, there's some gray area there. Uh, I think would be essential. Um, my next question is, uh, in areas of Dallas County that are HOA, historical landmark districts, conservation districts, and those that are uh, neighborhood stabilization, that have neighborhood stabilization overlays, are they exempt from these changes, from these code changes? Um, it all depends on how each one of those are structured. Um, a lot of those have a specific list of permitted uses in those, essentially their own zoning district. So um, if it just refers to our base code for the permitted uses, it would, the code amendments that are being proposed would apply to them. But if it says um, the only uses allowed here, are single family and church, then those are the only uses that are allowed there. Got it. So mostly it's neighborhood associations and those areas not designated as a district or, or association that will be impacted by this. Um, I'm not sure about that. I'm sure there's also private deed restrictions in some neighborhoods of the city, and and they could probably say in your private deed restriction, like the only thing you can do here is have a house, um, even though the zoning may allow more uses, but that would be a private civil matter between those uh, homeowners and, and whoever that future property owner might be. Okay. And, you know, I know there's been a lot of conversation recently with, uh, you know, overhauling developmental code to encourage a wider variety of housing in single family zones, basically kind of eliminating single family zones. If approved, like if this passes two years from now or whatever, a year from now, two years from now, how does that retroactively affect 
these care facilities working in single family zones? Well, what would not be single family zones anymore? Um, I I know that when I we when we started the meeting, we they hadn't even begun the the briefing to council just to kind of throw out some ideas, um, which is what I think you're referring to, which has been called eliminating single family zoning districts. I don't think that's likely to happen in Dallas just for politics reasons. They might encourage or might add some other options within our single family districts, or they might create a whole new zoning district. But um, really that whole discussion is like in phase zero. It, it hasn't even started a process yet. So um, right now we're just talking about these uses and these zoning districts we have right now. And our last question or comment is from Offutt. I will um, unmute you. Thank you. Um, going back to one of the issues that I believe that Mr. Morrow brought up, um, those hours, while they seem innocent enough, if you're living in a single family neighborhood on a single family street, those aren't uh, hours that really work with uh, people living, just living in their house. Um, the other part of that is my concern about the lackadaisical, lackadaisical attitude about the parking and traffic that seems to um, yeah, you only have 10 kids, but that's 10 extra parking spaces, um, and particularly in the inner city where our streets are extremely narrow. Um, so I, I, eliminating the SUP uh, requirement for single family um, zoning, it seems to me to be just an additional attack on people who want, who have chosen and invested to live in single family homes in Dallas. Okay. Thank you for those comments. All right, we are about 18 minutes overdue on our hour. Um, Chalanda. Hold up, hold up. Oh, okay. Hold up. I, I made a promise to, to someone in the chat that we, we've got two really quick questions and that's okay. the absolute end of the, Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, really quickly, um, from uh, Christine Hopkins, what is the largest child care facility that would be allowed in a residential neighborhood without an SUP if the rules change as proposed? Um, I, I would just say that that would be based on a lot of factors that, um, you know, I can't even estimate. Um, so I think the interior space has to have at least um, 30 square feet per child, and that excludes your hallways, your bathrooms, um, whenever we have wall-mounted furniture, um, and your exterior play areas have to be at least 80 square feet, and that can't exceed 25%, I think, of the interior space. So there's a, there's a lot of ratio differences, not to mention, um, as we've heard from other speakers, it's really difficult to get qualified staff um, and uh, at the staffing ratios, which I, I want to say uh, when my kids were infants, it was like uh, one staff person for every two infants or something like that. And um, and I was paying $1,200 a month in Dallas um, for full-time child care. Um, I never saw anything that was open past seven o'clock, to be honest. Um, but um, I don't know if we have time to hear from Ms. Rubin. She, she turned on her camera, so I mean, I, I think she might have some answers. I don't know. I, I was just going to add real quick, too, while we get her unmuted, that there's also going to be restrictions about the number of, of floor levels that you can have because certain age children need to be on the ground floor. There's ADA requirements. And then if you consider the fact that it's going to be within whatever, if it's in an R district, for example, it's going to be on a comparably sized uh, lot and it's going to meet the same size and setback requirements, all the same development standards. So you'll be able to build 
basically single story, maybe two story within a certain limited portion of the property based on coverage limitations imposed by the, the, the code amendment. And then also based on the fact that the state and whatever requires certain, you know, limitations to what floor certain ages can be on. Um, but that's, that doesn't necessarily, but I think the follow up in the chat was, is there a cap on the number of children? There, there is not a cap on the number of children that's part of the code amendment. It's just, it's gonna be based on other factors that, you know, the, the size and development standards and then whatever state regulations happen. And I see Ms. Rubin is unmuted now. No, I mean, you guys, gave exactly accurate information. I mean, by state standards, that, that is the square footage requirement. So it does automatically limit you by numbers of children. But I, I actually would um, ask staff if, if it needed to have a um, upward limit, seeing that the intention of this is not to have any big programs that are disruptive to neighborhoods, but rather to meet the needs, would an amendment to the code amendment that limited it to under a certain number of children be possible at this point? I, it, it couldn't come from staff. It has to come from council to do that. But um, every time we're regulating the development code, um, kind of one of the earlier slides is we have to make sure that there's a land use rationale uh, in any um, restrictions we put in zoning or else it could be challenged in the courts. So there has to be some strong, direct, proportional um, relationship to limiting the capacity of childcare facilities in residential districts. Um, and so I, I can't think of any direct land use rationale to do that when we have state ratios, state mandated ratios. And, and I would just add to that, that there are so many minimum standards. I mean, you're right. It's, you know, what floor you can be on, how many exits there are, how many sinks there are. How many, I mean, there's thousands of, of standards that will very much limit what you can do in, the, in these smaller operations. So. Thank you all very much. Um, the last question, I'm just gonna go ahead and answer with a yes. Um, it's from Karen Roberts. Um, if this change allows no SUP in multifamily areas, would the challenge be eliminated for Hart House? Um, the answer to that is yes, because they were in a multifamily uh, development already in a multifamily zoned area. And so if the SUP requirement were eliminated in multifamily areas, then they would have avoided several months process with us and could have gone directly to whatever other um, city departments they needed to take care of business with. So, um, yes. Um, and then we do see the rest of your comments and questions in the chat. They're recorded and we will um, get to those as we timely can. Thanks. So with that, I think we are wrapped up. And uh, again, if, if you all still have the link to that um, comment forum, we still would love to um, gather as many comments as possible. We'll be sharing those with the council districts. Um, and just, we really appreciate your time and, and your concern. And um, we really do thank you all for all of your time and effort, you know, no matter where you fall on the spectrum. Um, so just, I want to thank y'all again. All right, y'all have a great rest of your day. Oh, and we will be posting this online on our website for that daycares, um, a recording of this and the presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm.